what is the ICX front end. Uh, I'm Gavin Jackson, uh, group head of front end engineering. I've been working on fintech uh, since 2011, all in front end. And before that, I spent about six years creating web experiences, uh, mainly in the advertising sector for clients like Nike, Estelle, Estee Lauder, Mattel, and Intel, etc. Before we get into what is the ICX front end, I thought it might be useful to talk about what is the difference between front end and back end. Um, and here at Dunstan Thomas, uh, the front end team builds single page applications using the ICX framework, which renders information in the browser. Um, that information comes from the back end, either from a database or from a third party integration service, which could be thought of as a non DT back end. So the general flow. Uh, of a build of a screen is that front-end developers will take business requirements and work out how best to meet those requirements using the UI components that comprise the ICX framework. Uh, part of this process involves defining what information is needed from the back end. Um, this is delivered to the front end in the form of service responses, typically data models or data grids. The front end takes the back end provided information and renders it on screen for the user to view and interact with. All data is transmitted from the back end in JSON. Um, and to facilitate rapid prototyping and clear inter-team communication, front-end developers write and consume JSON files as mock services, which are then used as actual templates for the service responses for the real services developed by the back-end developers. Um, and these are ultimately swapped out in production for the real back-end services. So what is the ICX uh, front-end? It is a low-code UI framework. Um, it provides a set of UI components, which we call data components, and these are things like radio controls, checkboxes, text inputs, numbers, that sort of thing. Um, but you can piece them all together and build complex single page bespoke single page applications pretty quickly with virtually no custom JS coding, um, all delivered through configuration and optional styling. Um, this is a case study which shows um, these 12 wireframes were turned into 12 responsive screens um, with full accessibility, interactivity, um, branding, dynamic calculations, graphs, maps, sliders, um, and they all took less than a week. So in the right hands, the ICX front end can really, really can be very useful for uh, rapid prototyping, rapid building of systems. The current ICX began development in 2012. That's eight years it's been in development, and we use it at DT to deliver a number of projects to our clients, um, large scale enterprise platforms, um, including financial ones. And along the way, ICX has had to evolve and cope with complex business requirements uh, necessary to meet regulatory requirements, as well as provide um, intelligent forms to minimize errors and capture accurate information. So what is it? So it's a, uh, as I've said before, a low-code framework that contains a library of data components, and then the developer can arrange these data components on one of three things, dashboards, screens, and forms, and then define a way to navigate around the system. Uh, so dashboards are consist of apps laid out in a grid format, um, usually showing some sort of summary information, and act as a landing point to drill further down into the system. Uh, so this is a screenshot from the, uh, the DT admin uh, dashboard. It's so a very basic dashboard um, using some of our out of the box apps um, and that little bit of code in the top in the bottom left hand corner just shows the code that's used to drive the user activity app so um, with json we just describe that it's a stats app um, we give it a little name and then we tell it we effectively tell it what service url and level two service urls um, are where it's going to get its information and then we can tell it it's got to display that information as a donut chart and that general idea of using JSON just to describe the thing on screen and then provide some configuration just to tweak it, that's a very sort of common use case in the ITX uh, framework. Screens um, typically show read-only information. Um, and our screens are comprised of data components. And quite similar to the previous bit of code, we've got um, an asset allocation graph. I've decided to pick on graphs. and they're you can see the JSON syntax to configure that little uh, graph in the first screenshot. Um, and forms collect and validate information. And again, 
the little bit of code there just shows the underlying JSON code used to define that particular field, which allows us to capture um, monetary amount. And you can see we can specify things like it's required, it's got minimum and maximum values, and whether to show a currency symbol. So it's all quite simple when you get down to each individual field. Um, and with this sort of mechanism, you can obviously build up quite complex forms with lots of fields quite quickly. So everything is a data component. And I say ish because the, the things that contain the data components, the screens, the forms, and the dashboards aren't data components themselves, but everything that you see and interact with ultimately is a data component in the ICX front end. Okay, now I'm gonna just uh, dive into some sample code. Exit that. So this is a very simple um, form. So on the left is the um, JSON definition that drives the form on the right. Um, you can see all of our forms. So one of the main benefits of using um, you know, a set of pre-built uh, UI components is that all the responsive stuff is already taken care of. All of the accessibility is already taken care of. So you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, cross browser, cross device, that's already been done. Um, and what we have on the, the left is the code that drives this form. So if we if we look, it's quite a simple form. So we've got a, a title field and you can see the display type short code tells us the type of the thing that this is. And if I change this to a radio, um, you can see that it now changes to our standard radio component. The allowed values uh, tells it what possible values or options it might have. Um, and the fact that it's required is specified up there. Um, on the first name field, it's just a standard text box. And on the middle name field, it's also a text box, but you might notice that it's not required. So we show um, validity in two ways. So if, after you've interacted with a field, if you move away from that field and it's not valid, then we'll show the uh, validity. Um, and you can see here on the middle name, there is no uh, validation errors because it's not required. And then we also um, validate if you hit submit and any fields that weren't filled in have their uh, validity there. So all of that stuff is just out of the box. Um, that's a very simple example. On a more complex example, not too much, um, we'll add in a very common use case, which is where you have a set of titles and then you might have an other option and then you've got the option to uh, specify. And so this is very simple. Um, obviously with the allowed values, we have an allowed value called other. And then in here, we've created another text box, um, which is our please specify. And it just has the rules which says only show when title equals other and that's it um, this is also set to be required which means that you have to fill it in to be able to submit the form um, but one thing that we do with our form submission validation engine is that we don't actually validate things you can't see so um, this form can validate just by picking that title but if i go to other and hit that it's going to force me to fill that in before i can then submit it Okay, I'm going to go to the third and final example, which is a bit more of a complex example. Um, what this is, is a postcode lookup. Uh, so what we have is a, an input field, which is our postcode. And this is still our text box. Um, but now we're doing a bit more complicated stuff or more advanced stuff where we've got a validation regular expression, which uh, I took from the post office. And that just says you can't enter in anything but a valid UK postcode. We've got a couple of other things in here, so it forces uppercase and restricts it, so you can only type up to eight characters and stuff like that. So, um, and then the the slightly more clever bit is uh, we've got this lookup service URL, which um, tells it to render a button here, and then when you click that button, it's going to hit this endpoint. Um, and at this uh, in this scenario, the endpoint is just a static JSON file, but this could be a postcode lookup service, and we're going to pass the postcode to that endpoint. And what's going to happen is that service is going to return us um, a results object which has effectively ID text pairs, which is like allowed values. And the way the lookup service works on this particular component is that um, any keys, object keys here, correspond with um, short codes. So we actually have a component called results, which is called hidden, and this is going to be populated by the lookup. And then this has got a rule on here which says when its value is not equal to empty, it's going to take a field called address and set its allowed values to that its own value. And then the field address is a radio component um, and it's got a visibility rule that says only show it when it's not empty. 
So if I just click that through, so if we click on the lookup, that does a search, and then we've got our response, and then that's pushed it into the hidden field, which has then used rules to push it into the radio button component, and uh, we can then pick an address and proceed with the next part of the screen. Um, and we've also uh, we've also added a little search again link, which uh, is here, and when we click that, it just chucks us back into the first state. And the way that works um, is that we've just got a text block, which allows us to render just some HTML, and we're, we're calling a global function to just say, set the data components, results, and postcode to empty. So we're effectively clearing out the results and the postcode, and then that chucks us into the uh, original state of the form. OK, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. That was the examples. So we've got some key principles that we like to go with uh, for front-end development in ITX. So we like it to be an understandable syntax for hand coding of the JSON. So um, yeah, we write that JSON yeah, by hand. So it's nice that it's, uh, yeah, it's sensible and logical. Um, the JSON files can get quite uh, complicated and large. So we like to try not to repeat ourselves. Um, and we do that by um, using, uh, we've in introduced JSON inheritance, context and snippets. So mechanisms that are familiar with programmers to just be, allow us to reuse certain bits of other code. So an example would be a postcode lookup like that. Um, although it is only about three data components, if we had that in multiple places in a system, we could put that into a snippet and then just use that in lots of different places. So that means that if the regular expression changes, we need to change it in one place. Um, and also it means that we can, we can keep things nice and consistent and quite short as well. Um, we do believe uh, that it should all be well documented um, and with uh, good examples. Um, and something for front-end developers is that we like fast feedback loops. So we can change stuff and don't even have to refresh the browser or do a build step. It should just uh, change on screen. Um, and uh, we also think it should work as expected, especially when you get to the more complicated things with inheritance, context, and snippets. Um, it, you know, as developers are using this stuff, and you know they try and do something that is logical from a programming point of view, we make sure that that's also logical and possible um, with our um, JSON preprocessing engine, which is what we call it. Um, the whole system is also extensible, so although there are a number of out-of-the-box components, uh, there is a mechanism to um, define and lazy load custom components uh, quite easily. So if there are features that um, we, you know, we can't meet, um, uh, sorry, requirements that we can't meet using out-of-the-box, um, an option is to write a custom component and then just consume that in the project. Um, it's also designed to be very skinnable. So um, you can change the branding very easily. There's uh, the concept of a base brand, which gives us our sort of core functionality. And so it lays everything out and makes buttons work and thing, do the animations. But that's designed so that it can be overridden very easily. So that if we want to make um, a completely bespoke custom brand for clients who have you know, very specific branding guidelines, we can do that. And then we also have a white labeling system, which allows us to just change the logo and change the color and very quickly get out a pretty looking system. Um, yeah, a pretty little white labeled system, um, which is also you know useful for clients without those branding guidelines or clients who you know would choose to spend resources elsewhere. Um, and we also believe in additive enhancements. So when we get requirements that we can't meet with the current uh, ITX framework, we will always look at those and nine times out of ten we'll try and enhance the framework to you know allow those uh, new requirements to. To, to work, um, but they'll be additive, so you have to kind of opt in either generally through new settings or new configuration. Um, so existing behavior is the default behavior, um, and new functionality yeah, can come in. And like I say, the, the framework's been in development for about uh, eight years, so it's got a lot of uh, features have been added. And these are some of the key features. Um, so things like um, off-screen renders and different loaders, so that's that's quite important. So as um, no screen knows what it's going to look like until it's been told, so um, we don't want a janky screen load, so we render everything off-screen behind a loader, um, and then once everything's initialized, that's when we uh, hide the loader and show the screen, and that just makes it feel nice and robust. Um, we have lazy loading mechanisms, so um, there is a subset of components which are included in the main bundle, and then there's larger components which are maybe less used which are lazy loaded only when the form uh, uses them 
Um, everything's responsive. We have uh, been recently been working on an automated acceptance testing system, which uses screenshot comparison to reduce uh, what to, yeah, so that we can easily uh, make a change in one place and be confident that that change is uh, happening in the areas that we're expecting. Um, we have a push notification system, a hash routing system. So the hash routing system allows you to navigate through any ICX uh, front end using your browser back forward buttons and bookmark anywhere and you can deep link into um, any places. Uh, we have a text resourcing system which allows us to um, externalize the text so that if you wanted to do a multilingual system, in theory, it would be possible. We haven't done one yet. Uh, we've got performance monitoring built in, and I've got the next slides we'll be talking about the performance monitoring. Um, accessibility, we've been doing a lot of work on accessibility. We, we have uh, automated accessibility testing now um, to ensure that um, we don't introduce uh, accessibility issues. Um, there are 40 different uh, data components, uh, and they're all documented with sample code uh, as well. So that's uh, some of the key features. So this is the performance monitoring dashboard, which is used to uh, it, uh, monitor how an ICX uh, system is uh, performing over time. Uh, so we have uh, screen timings, which uh, records how long the um, main loader is shown. So as I said, the, off, the screens are rendered off screen um, behind a loader. And so we time how long that loader is on screen for and then break down whatever long running services are, are being called at that time. Um, so then you can work out which screens are, you know, perhaps you know, opportunities for optimization. Uh, we also have um, service timing, so every backend service can potentially be decorated with some metadata to uh, start recording uh, how long it's taken. And again, we can uh, report over time how those uh, how it's performing, and you know, identify or spot trends, or perhaps when. You know, maybe there was a server upgrade uh, and you can see the benefit of that over time. Um, and we've very recently, as in last week, been working on um, a drill down so that you can then work out. Um, so just seeing what service is taking a long time isn't necessarily that helpful. We need to drill down and uh, diagnose what's happening within that service. And so using the common correlation ID, we can work out all of the sub subservice calls that are being called uh, within the, uh, the the top one, um, and then from this you can work out you know, which providers are, are calling these service are providing these services, um, which services are blocking other services. So you know we have to validate before we can load the next screen data, um, and then which services calls we're making concurrently. And so this is all um, stuff we can use uh, to optimize and identify performance bottlenecks. Um, we have looked at um, the, the tech stack um, for quite recently, um, in fact this year, and uh, we found that it has a similar performance to things like React, Svelte, and Vue. Um, we actually created benchmark systems uh, that rendered data components um, and then compared them against the current ITX framework. Um, and so far there has not been a UI requirement that our clients have wanted that we could not meet with the current ITX. Uh, that was me, I said that this month. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of resources available. So we have um, documentation. So this presentation is based off uh, a piece of documentation called the What is ICX front end, um, which is in our documentation system. Uh, the documentation system has the live coding sandboxes as well in there. So you can play with the, the samples that I was playing with. Um, and uh, this is what some of the documentation looks like for one of the data components. Um, so this documentation is actually generated from the code. So we write manifests which describe the settings um, for each data component. And then the documentation system takes those manifests and generates uh, markdown documentation, which is what you're seeing here. Um, and it also generates um, live examples as well with sample code. Um, and so this is just the um, an example page of uh, the radio component. Um, and you can see the tab system below there. Um, other things that are also useful ways to learn more about the ITX framework um, is uh, the prototyping process. Uh, like I say, we can build uh, systems quite quickly and seeing how a system is built is quite a useful way of learning and pair programming is also uh, quite a useful uh, tool. Okay, and that is the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening and watching.